So maybe um, I'm, I'm so happy and so honored to be your moderator today, as you are a true inspiration to me. I want to ask you, and maybe Marcello, I will start with you, as I consider you as a front runner uh, of the world in regards to biodiversity and business. I want to ask you uh, why and how do you do it? So meaning that in this journey, what was your tipping point? Was it, did you engage a long time ago? How did you play around? Hello everyone, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Really, for us, there are many connections between Brazil and France and Change Now has been an amazing event so far. Just to let you know, um, I come from Natura & Co, which is a Brazilian-based company. Natura was born 50 years ago in Brazil. Uh, it was founded by three great men, Luis, Pedro and Guilherme, who attended the first COP, the COP in 92 mm. in Brazil, the Earth Conference, that was the mother of all COPs. And after attending that COP, they decided, well, what if we took biodiversity into everything we do and we bring the fruits of the Amazon inside our jars? And they started to operate with Amazonian communities and it has been a journey. We've learned a lot. It's not easy to operate with nature. You have different cycles. You have business cycles and nature cycles. Nature does not respect quarters or <laughs> early results. It respects its own timing. So it takes weeks on boats to properly source and to engage and to build the connection with communities. So, and it has been a great journey. What we see is that in order to make the bioeconomy real for us and for others, it's not about only one company doing things. It's about engaging and connecting the dots between science, public policy, private sector, and finance. That's the journey we are. So I think just to finalize your first question on the tipping point, we are very worried that the Amazon is reaching its tipping point and deforestation was progressing a lot. Reason why we did many public awareness initiatives like placing a tree counter in front of the Brazilian Congress so everyone would be aware in real time on how deforestation was progressing. And when we deliver our annual results, or our quarterly results, we also deliver how the forest is progressing in its own results. So connecting nature with business. Very impressive. Laurent, you have been a pioneer actually in uh, biodiversity for such a long time. When we were preparing the session, I was uh, really um, happy to um, to connect the dots with you, the, you, the work you've done at Guerlain on this. So can you please share us, with us your story as a leader on biodiversity? Did you have a tipping point? How did you uh, join this movement towards uh, nature positive? Uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, by the <laughs> way, and for your witnesses. And first of all, for me, um, I would say it's been 15 years already. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it was a wake-up call, and the way I, I put it is uh, it was many encounters, encounters after encounters, but if I want to recall one name, it's one name, it's one flower, and one animal. Tell us and more. The name was Sylvie Benard, and Sylvie Benard has been instrumental within LVMH because she was really the first lady uh, to push everything. And I had a to discussion with her back to uh, 20, 2006. Uh, the flower was an orchid. Because at the time of Guerlain, we had to find the right orchid for our products, and it brought me to, to China. When I, for the first time in my life, I've seen a primary forest. I can tell you that, you know, you don't know what it is until you've been there. Tell it's us about it. What is it exactly? Well, it's, so, it's just something that you don't know, because we know the forest that has been, you know, developed by man. But everything is special, and you know what? The first thing I remember, it is just beautiful. There is an harmony in that forest that you can, you can, and the sounds and the smells, everything. And the, the, the animal is a bee. And the wake up call was uh, um, mandatory for us because uh, at the time of Guerlain, uh, it was a simple equation no bees, no flowers, no fragrance. No Guerlain. So it starts like this one. And, and because, you know, you have to, uh, to sustain your, your company, you have to do something about it. So it was the tipping points. But many encounters since then, many encounters. And tipping points after tipping points, encounters, reading, 
I would like to, to quote some names, by the way. Um, Sylvie Benin was one of them. Uh, obviously, uh, there was someone else, Joseph Magraf, a biologist, German biologist, who introduced to me this uh, primary forest in China, was also a, a person uh, called Thierry Dufresne, a species of bees. So please note down for the one that don't know. I, I, I think it's always interesting to understand who has inspired us in our journey, what book we have read, who, who we have met, which scientists really uh, did this wake-up call, and I think it's very helpful for all of us. Hey, wake-up call is every day. I see also <laughs> my friends, uh, Gilda Bonnell here. Gilda has been 15 years, you know, waking me, you know, to the, to the, the discussion about this one. There's also Stéphane Allaire, Many Sandrine Summer is with us. So it's really a country, and, and recently, and probably we'll have an occasion to speak about that, recently, the most recent tipping point is Antonio Nobre. Antonio Nobre with Flying Rivers, perhaps we'll discuss that. Yes, we'll discuss that later. Thank you so much. So, uh, Ubi, uh, please tell us, uh, have you, um, in this journey, because you are really serving uh, several corporates around the world, so have, has COP15 been a tipping point in the journey of corporates? Have you seen a change happening? So first of all, thanks for being here. It's great to be with all of you here. Um, Stephanie, to your question, I think uh, COP15 was a very important moment. Yeah? But um, I'm a mountaineer, so if I take an analogy, it's a bit like you get somewhere, you know, let's say you get to Chamonix, yes, and then you decide you know, which mountain do you want to climb. Right? That mountain hasn't been decided yet. Yeah? So it's more like the high-level destination, the right to governments to put regulations in place now, but it's really, um, as Stephanie said before, it's the start of a journey. Um, and if I may compare that to the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement was, was a similar milestone from a carbon perspective. If I then look at what corporates have done after Paris, you know, it was five, six years only about commitments. 90% only about commitments. No, and commitments don't help us. Yeah, okay. Yeah? And this time, we do not have another six, seven years of time to wait until we move from high-level goals to action. But you saw companies acting after COP15 really on commitments regarding biodiversity. You've seen that change. I have seen that, uh -huh. but the, the, the share of companies who are on the commitment level have to increase drastically and the folks who are moving it with action, with implementation plans, with embedded organizational structure is far away from where we need to go. And this time we don't have as much time as, we, as it took us for, for climate, so we need to accelerate. Thank you. So we can feel the sense of urgency with this amazing leaders that are fully conscious and acting every day. Maybe, Laurent, you can share with us what you do today in this journey at NSE also, what you, and it's a learning journey, as it was said. So in this learning journey, what you've done, where, what gives you hope, what were the obstacles along the way, how did you, uh, you know, uh, shift a little the path forward? Well, there's a lot to say, so I will focus on one thing. In, uh, you know, it's uh, obstacles. We have a huge one uh, in uh, crafting cognac. In, uh, in Charente. And uh, that is uh, a word, a quote. I'm using very much that quote because it was a journey with uh, now my friends, Stéphane Allaire, when we, uh, we took the train uh, to, uh, to Angoulême and then the car from Angoulême to Cognac. And when we arrived at Cognac, Stéphane looked at me and said, well, you just showed me a desert of wines, a desert of vines. So that's the oxymoron, as we say. You know, that's what is the reality. So we have to do something about this. And to make a long story short, we have two programs. One is called Living Soils. And one is to be called Living Landscape. And they have in common those two programs, Living Soils and Living Landscape, the trees. And because we, we, we know about the trees, carbon, etc., but there's so much more about trees. And you all, it's uh, the home of fauna, it's the home of microorganisms. And I was fascinated by the book of uh, Peter Voleben, uh, The Hidden Life of, of, of Trees, for instance. 
uh, in the lives, in the, in the water cycle, so important, so many things about trees. And in fact, the trees will help us both in the soil with agroforestry, and we started the program, super important programs. It's about developing, it's about measuring, obviously, and changing, and landscape. And one of the, of, of the elements that we're going to develop is called Mill Palace. Mill Palace is, in fact, a thousand kilometers, a thousand kilometers of trees and edges with the purpose that we are going to change the landscape of the region. And it's going to look back as it was 50 years or 60 years ago, and it will be a marker of back to biodiversity, to uh, listen to birds again, to create everything which is necessary. So that's, that is uh, one of the major things that we are doing at the moment. Oh, very impressive, Laurent. And maybe to, to build on this point, because the main question when we uh, meet uh, CEOs around the world is that uh, we believe, and you are part of them, that there is a way to reconcile impact or positive impact or nature positive impact, even though it's challenging, with economic performance. Can you elaborate on that? How do you see uh, the both coming together? Well, um, for all of us, it's about what we can do with our in, in our companies or organization. And we do our share, and it's, it's about you know, making more than our share. Because the stake is so huge that we need the same level of response. Uh, so there are different ways to do it. You know, as far as NSC is concerned, not only you know, we do take care about you know, the hedges, but we have a big program also which is beyond business, which is about regenerating the forest of the world, 50,000 hectares in 10 years. So it's due to do our share and more than that. And um, you mentioned also just before in, in, the, in the former sp speech the thing about economy. Mm. And this is also something that we do take care of it because you're right to say money matters. In fact, the two, the two KPIs, even for, for us, are cash and profit. So once the day we find the, uh, and it's, it's like you know, also an, an appeal today, the future uh, Nobel Prize of Economy that is able to transform our PNL, including, in fact, the cost of nature, then we'll be also moving even, even, even faster. So that, that is also the, the stakes behind us. It's what we can do for us now but uh, in, a, in a larger scale. Very clear. The way we look at it and reinvents the way we look at PNL, including nature. Wow. Uh, Marcello, maybe you can share with us also uh, the how you do it. Uh, you've been such a pioneer. We are all looking at Natura & Co. as the pioneer in the world on embracing biodiversity in its operating model. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, with pleasure. So I think there is one very practical example. We were working with traditional communities for around 15 years. And one leader of the region said, there is a, a tree that is on the verge of extinction because its wood was to be taken down by the community to produce broomsticks in the rich part of Brazil. And then we said, well, let's see if there are another uses that we would have for the tree instead of its wood. And we, with a lot of science, innovation, we understood that we could use its fruits to produce our products with better performance. And so we would be able to pay three times more for half of the tree's fruits than the community would get for the wood of the tree. So immediately the community stopped chopping and start planting. I think that's very symbolic and that helped to reverse the course of extinction for the ukuba tree, which is one of the many. So, and we spoke about the diversity that nature has and, and we heard about the millions of species and there is an indigenous saying in Brazil that the Amazon actually has more ice than leaves uh -huh. because we have so many millions of insects and, and, and different species that we are just beginning to understand the richness of it and how we can we can build an economy that combines both. Because I think the real mystery for meetings like this is how we move away from a perspective where you have economic development in one side and preservation in the other side into combining both. Of course, it's possible to have sustainable development. We've been doing that, not only Natura, mankind has been doing that for thousands of years. The Amazon is not a forest. The Amazon is probably the biggest garden on Earth. It has been populated with more than 20 million people 
for thousands of years. We just have to learn again how to do it on a sustainable way. Reason why, it's not only the Amazon, it's everything in the equatorial tropical forests of Africa, Southeast Asia. We need to get back into a model where it's non-predatory, where we take nature into the business model properly with the respect it deserves. And Marcelo, you've shown in this example and the various ones that I've heard of is that you are able to demonstrate that you can move the needle, really. How do you scale? Because this is a topic and the question for all of us is how do you manage to scale? Because we need to move at the speed that the world needs. So therefore, how do you scale? How do you manage that? Correct. So I, I think and do you? Because it's not so easy. Yes, I think we do. We, so we had this, uh, what we call the Amazonian board, combining people from our board of directors, but also indigenous leaders, scientists, um, um, the workers who are in the region as well. And, and one of the things that was pointed out by a professor from geography, uh, Berta Becker, she said, listen, why are you just supplying from the Amazon and not aggregating value on the region, rethinking the design of the whole organization? So why only sourcing and not bringing the, also the oils and aggregating in different ways. So we built something called the Eco Park, mm -hmm. which I think it's how we are going to scale up possibilities of moving production in the way that it's very north-south into something that is more distributed globally and local sourced and local produced with gains for nature and gains for carbon at the same time. Congrats. And maybe uh, one last question before we go to Ubi is the it's all about the lining, you know, and you, s you were saying that uh, market cycle and nature cycle, uh, cycle don't always align, you know. It's, uh, so what would be, uh, what's your learning on this journey, uh, looking at uh, the fact that uh, it may be challenging at some point or sometimes in life to really realign both on being nature positive and really having true economic performance at the same time. What's your reflection there? So, uh, uh, sustainability has many acronyms. Sorry for bringing some of those along. But I think we have to align what we see nowadays. IPCC, the scientists on carbon, they already did the math. We know where we are on carbon. We produce 32 uh, gigatons of CO2 per year. We know where we are in terms of each one of our countries. We know the NDCs from the Paris Agreement, where we are, where we must be in five years. We know, or we should know, where each one of our companies are. We have science-based targets, we have an abate curve of emissions, and we should know how our finance relates to risks under TCFD. The set for carbon is done. We have to do the same for nature. Nature doesn't have the same metrics. So we need to build with IPBS, which is an institution that has only two years, how the metrics of nature will work. We need to set the same standards, and that's why the COP15 was far beyond just the global framework with uh, generic targets. It was a refresh button for each one of our countries to set what are called the NBCEPs, so the metrics, the national standards for biodiversity. We must get interested in it. We, we must understand who's doing that, which projects will be in there, and connecting with science-based targets for nature, and finally, the work that I'm part of, the effort on the workforce for TNFT, the Task Force for Nature Financial Disclosure. Once we align the four metrics, I think we'll be able to bring carbon credits that will be efficient, that will support projects, that will bring nature back. I think that's the journey. Bringing nature metrics together. Wow. Uh, Ubi, maybe because you see so many companies, and uh, we have heard from you uh, earlier that uh, we're not moving fast enough, or they are moving towards commitments, but very little moving to action. We would love, because it's a session where I would love people to be inspired and to bring hope to this session. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Who are the leaders around the world, the corporates, that you believe are, are moving the needle in this direction? I'm happy to share a few um, examples. And maybe I start with a pattern that I can see for those companies who are leading. I think they have two, um, two characteristics. Number one is they have a CEO, a leader, who makes his or her team see what's happening and sees the facts around it. Yeah? So it's a very personal way of looking at what's happening in the world. So therefore your tipping points are important and to understand and when you what's say happening. See, sorry for me to understand, yeah. for us to understand, see is that they 
those CEOs? They bring that team in uh, nature, or is it more about, you know? So I've just recently worked with one CEO who took um, um, her whole management team to Greenland for three days. They were living one night below a glacier. They were listening to what's happening, and they heard scientists from MIT talking what it actually means. Wow. That's what it is. Powerful. And she was a big believer. Her team was almost there. And even she said, this trip changed my perspective on the world. So I think to see it time and again, and that's not a one-time thing, to see it time and again and to embrace us together as a team and to live it together for a few days is super important. That's one. Now, strong leaders make people follow, yeah? And they make them follow in an inspired way. So the second piece is nature cannot be a burden. If you talk as a leader as a burden, oh, we have to do this thing as well on top of carbon, on top of uh, safety regulations and so forth, that doesn't work. And I've seen that over the past 30 years multiple times. When you think about the 80s and 90s in automotive, European car manufacturers were complaining about quality now being an additional piece to it. The Japanese did it completely different. They said, we jump on it. We change our whole business model and it will be beneficial because it's lower cost, it's lower inventory, it's happy clients and it's lower maintenance. I've seen that then personally again in, in, uh, in my work um, that I did in the mining industry. You know, some miners said, fatalities, oh my God, do we really need to go to zero? Others said, of course we need to go to zero. Because the, un it, not just because it's an important objective, but the underlying processes that allow you to get to zero fatalities is operational efficiency. So it's beneficial from both perspectives. And that we have to do again now in nature to say, you know, what does it mean? I'll give you one example. We work for a leading vaccine producer. Yeah? They have had a 10% cost reduction last year. Now, if you go back and say, okay, now we put another effort on from a nature perspective, they would say, well, how do we do that? And then you say, well, let's think about it. You know, take certain tests. One, for example, is where they needed four eggs so far. And the challenge was, how do we move down to one? And this is nature positive thinking and it also has a cost reduction element to it. So I think this yin yang of nature and benefits is something that we all need to embed in it. And it's very, it's difficult, you know, because it's not like a, a one solution serves everything. It's a very deep thinking where you need to get to the metrics, you need to get to the standards, you need to define it yourself so far, even if, you know, we're working a lot with uh, science-based targets with nature together with our Qantas friends. Even if that's developing now, not so far we are more working in a segment where some forward-leaning CEOs who really want to make a positive to the world see the business case on top and move. And that has to change with regulation and potentially also with cost of an action. I would add that one as well. Cost of an action, that's a very good one. And actually, I also believe that we, I mean, it's yesterday we were at a session on the role of board and we're talking about those topics, moving from hygiene to uh, thinking about it as a competitive advantage because companies with a positive impact will thrive chosen by people, by consumers, by employees, by partners, investors. Nevertheless, um, can you share Ubi, with us an example of, um, so we understand very well the spirits and the mindset of the leader that will drive this change because it's all about leadership. And nevertheless, is there an example, a, a business case you can share with us about a company who has been transforming towards uh, being nature positive or is on this journey and uh, the case for it? Yeah, I mean, all our work is, is um, centered around business cases that we do, right? I mean, the most, the easiest one to understand is um, if you think about regenerative agriculture, right? I mean, there the business case is very obvious, right? That you say, you know, this is nature positive, but at the same time, you know, farmers, you do not um, have a winning argument with farmers if you just talk about nature positive, mm -hmm. you know? They need to feed their, not just their animals, but also their families. 
uh, they have cash constraints. So I think with, with farmers, to me, it was always like a, a test case almost. You know? Do you make them understand? And that business case uh, is actually positive. You know, we've worked with three leading global banks who give credit to farmers. And the core was to convince farmers to see that regenerative agriculture actually has a positive business case. So that's very rewarding to see. But it's not just that one, you know, I mean, there's lots of other examples where the business case can be seen, but it needs to be done very specifically. Yeah? Take crop, for example, you know, I mean, if you think about crop in Brazil, you think, think about deforestation. If you think about crop in the US, you think about, okay, I mean, how do, how do we get down the fertilizer mm -hmm. that we use? If you do it in in uh, India or in Egypt, so you think right. about maybe we should in in uh, increase it uh, to make a positive case for le lesser land use by doing that. So what I'm saying is the business case is specific, but it can be found. Sure. Laurent, maybe uh, we move into a topic that is also dear to your heart. It's about leadership, because you are inspired in by leaders along the journey. And I would love for you to share with the audience, uh, what does it take as a leader to really move the needle? What is really the skills or the values of a leader to make the shift happen? Well, to, to perhaps to, to adapt to the situation uh, and, and to, be, to, be, to be short, I would say anticipation one, ambition second, and coalition third. So let's, let's, let's explain because they are connected. In anticipation, is, uh, it's really about understanding, as you say, sensing the case. So learning machine, uh, connecting with, with everything. And then you can really sense the urgency more than uh, the overall topics. It's coming then the ambition. Again, facing the stakes, we need the, the level of answer of the same magnitude. So it has to be huge, super big. And coming to the third then, I say coalition because it's beyond just the uh, collective action. Uh, we know that even big companies, they don't have means enough to make the change. So that, that is it, you know, decisive actions with, with a coalition. And tell and that, us more about coalition, because you have experienced many, many types of coalition, many types of collective. Maybe you can share with us your thoughts on this one. What I, I can share also for, to start with is an obstacle. The obstacle in the companies, still in also in the sustainable development is, but can I own the thing, you know? When I came with my um, project about forest regeneration, obviously it's not only for analysis, for LVMH, it's for the planet because I believe it's one of the, the best tools to solve the issues. And some of them would say, very important people would say, yes, but if you own it, why should I own it? You know, that, that, that is so something behind. So, this is, this is also what, what we have to overcome, you know, being able to be competitors on the field, because we are in the business. It's like, you know, it's very soon it's going to be uh, Roland Garros, right? You know, so we won't see Nadal, uh, we won't see Federer against Nadal, but those guys on the ground, they're super competitive, but behind, they are friends. So that's the point, you know, we have to do something collective, coalition, coalition, coalition. Thank you. Moving from a competitive only to a more cooperative agenda. That's not an easy one. That's not an easy one at all, <laughs> at all. Maybe Marcello, a word on, uh, on leadership and with your an amazing experience at Natura & Co. What does it really take as a leader, as a front runner also, to move the needle? I, I think we are, everyone who's in this room is really privileged, right? We, we have the privilege to stop on a Friday morning to discuss the possibilities of of the world moving ahead, everyone here is a leader on that space. I, I had the privilege this week to, to meet on Wednesday the former president of the Chinese Central Bank. And what they are doing in green finance is amazing. It's important to understand. It, will, it already changed the scale of solar energy. It will change the scale on regeneration as well. I think in leadership for everyone, we have to listen more and to understand the different perspectives that will make climate change being addressable. I think we are, I, I see sometimes that we are going to a direction where we'll just try to work on the energy transition, we'll move away from fossil fuels into renewables, mostly in the north part of the globe, that won't be enough. So 
that is my key point. I think if we just make the energy transition, there will be no Paris Agreement because the tropical forests will be taken down and without the tropical forests there, there is no Paris Agreement. On the other hand, if we just work on the tropical forests and we don't make the energy transition, there is no Paris Agreement as well. So we have to work together. In order to work together, we have to listen to each other. I think listening is a leadership skill that has been underestimated. Life is sure a learning journey and listening is a critical uh, element into it. Thank you so much. Ubi, anything that you would like to share based on your amazing experience with all those cooperation about what does it take as a leader? You were sharing the, the example of the CEO, but what you've seen and what does it really take as a leader to make the shift happen in companies? So I, I, I want to build on your points yeah, that uh, Laurent Marcello have said. On top of what I've heard, you know, I mean, what is the objective of a leader? It is to have impact at scale, right? It's not just to do something, but to scale. The real challenge is scaling. To do a pilot somewhere is not difficult, but to really scale it. And if you want to scale it, you need, on top of what has been shared, you need a organizational home for the topic to live. You need to embed it into your team. So, for example, the way we've structured um, sustainability in BCG is to say, you know, we have nature, food, and agriculture on the same level as decarbonization. That's very important, and I don't see that much in companies. Thank you. Once you have that, it's very important that you don't build a huge think tank that sits somewhere in the ivory tower. The strong leaders embed nature by embedding it as a target to their PL leaders. So it's all about action, right? It's all about integrated action. You know, it's not integrated something at the side, action. it's something, as I said before, on the quality side. You need to embed nature now in everything you do, and there's no que question that we have an additional KPI when we look at uh, what we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you to the three of you for the amazing panel. Thank you. <laughs>